And now it's my pleasure to introduce Paula Buderini. Uh, Ms. Buderini grew up in Connecticut, but took her first opportunity to escape small town New England and with it New England winters to work as a reporter in Dallas. Since then, she's traveled all over the world, reporting from Madrid, Rome, London, Berlin, Paris, and various locations in South America, Asia, and Oceania. She spent four years covering the voyages of Pope John Paul II and has reported for United Press International and the Chicago Tribune. While reporting in Italy, she met a fellow foreign correspondent, John, and the two married in Rome in 1989. Less than a month later, John was shot and injured by a sniper bullet while reporting in Romania uh, on the Romanian uprising. His physical wounds took about a year to heal, but the family's emotional and spiritual wounds lingered. Ms. Buderini's new memoir, Keeping the Faith, explores that process of healing and the importance of the simple ritual of the family meal. Krista Tippett of NPR's Speaking of Faith says, this book evokes life at its most serious and dire, and at its most mysterious and delectable. And now please join me in welcoming Paula Buderini. Thank you, Rachel. It's been many, many years since uh, I've been in this bookstore, which I used to haunt uh, when I was at Wellesley in the late 60s and early 70s. And I'm really happy to be back. Keeping the feast has many threads. Food, comfort, family, friends, memory, and grace. It talks about healing, healers, health, hospitals, illness, and medicines, about sanity and insanity, about Italy and France, Poland, Romania, the new Germany, and countries that no longer exist, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, the Soviet Union. It discusses patience as a vice and anger as a virtue, as well as war, peace, truth and lies, and a pet peeve, family secrets. It would have had yet another thread if my ed editor hadn't made me take out the murder. But she was right, that's another story. <laughs> I started to write this book back in early 1996, seven years after my husband, John Taglebu, reporting for the New York Times, was shot and nearly killed by a sniper in Timisoara, Romania where the uprising against communist dictator Nicolae Ceausescu first broke out. The wound was a nasty one, with the bullet entering here, racing across his back, and exiting the other side. Had he been shot in a normal country, it would have been a grave injury, though not necessarily a life-threatening one. In a country like Romania, though, where most hospitals simply had no modern antibiotics, it was soon deadly serious. So serious that when the Romanian doctors saw septicemia setting in, they managed to get the government to open its air airspace briefly and allow a German Red Cross plane to medevac us to the safety of a Munich hospital. All told, John underwent seven operations before he was released. The surgeons gave him hepatitis B on his way out the door. He underwent rehab to learn to walk properly again, and three years of daily exercises so he could put his own socks on. We didn't know he'd also picked up a case of post-traumatic stress syndrome until a couple of years after the shooting. That led to a wicked case of clinical depression in 1992, which took him years to fight his way through. We were helped immeasurably by going back to a place we both loved, Rome, whose light and heat, food and wine, art and architecture helped heal him as much as the close friends we'd made there earlier. The depression resurfaced 11 years later in Paris, and this time, we both were better at recognizing and fighting it. If it comes back again, and both of us know very well that's a good possibility, we think we've got the systems in place to fight it off another time, more quickly, we hope, and with less residual damage. But with depression, you never know. 
John isn't here with me tonight because he's babysitting our 12-year-old daughter back in France. But I thought it might be useful for you to know what sort of person he is when he's not suffering from depression and what first drew me to him. Maybe it was John's Jersey accent or his help in the kitchen that so reminded me of home. Maybe it was his innate gentleness or the kindness and light I saw in his eyes. Maybe it was that he looked like a cross between Alan Alda and my mother's cousin Tom, or that his face was as boyish as his two, two short ch chinos. Whatever it was, all I knew was that I came to love him because he wrote chatty letters home to his mother every week, because even in his 40s, he called her mother, because he still referred to his father, long dead, as daddy. I came to love him because he never stopped talking about his parents, three brothers, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, and nephews, and above all, about his children, Peter and Anna. I came to love him because his family was enormous, as, I, as mine once had been. As time passed, I loved him because he spoke broadly and listened deeply, because I knew he'd never bore me, no matter how long we lived. I loved him because he could speak English, Italian, German, Spanish, French, and Latin, because he could read ancient Greek and a smattering of Hebrew. I loved him because he could not read music, but could read and sing Gregorian chant. I loved him because he was not afraid of tears, his own or mine. I loved him because he grew up eating not just pasta, but also, like my family, polenta, that cheap yellow cornmeal mush that kept generations of northern Italian peasants from starving. I loved him because he loved the two children he had and because he told me he wished he could give me a child too. I loved John also because, like me, he liked to cook as much as he liked to eat, because both of us grew up in homes where honest food was the central magnet that brought us all to the table two or three times a day. I loved him because both of us were blessed with a metabolism that let us eat with pleasure, not guilt. I loved him also because both our families came to the table not just to eat, but to talk, laugh, share our problems, share our lives. I loved him because I could envision a lifetime of ordinary meals together, alone or with good friends, who might share our sense of what nourishment really means. I loved him because he knew that good talk, good books, good music were one staff of life, and that simple good food shared with others was the second. I loved him because he was smart enough to know that food was a lot more than fuel. My original idea back in 1996 was to write a detailed chronological description of what happened to John so that his two older children, Peter and Anna, would understand everything he had gone through so that there would be a full chapter on the shooting and its aftermath in the Taglebu family history that John has always loved researching. It was I who decided to write it and not John because John himself was unconscious for much of the beginning of the story and, like the children, needed to be told what he'd gone through, too. I wrote for several months and can tell you that it was deeply painful. The writing dragged us both back to a place neither of us was really ready to revisit. John himself, at the time, was leery about the whole project. The children were basically freaked, afraid to hear about it. I myself felt as if I were opening a vein in writing with my own blood, in short, it was not a whole lot of fun, which is why when I suddenly found out I was pregnant at age 45 for the first time in my life, that I decided I would put the project off and simply enjoy my pregnancy and the first year or so of the baby's life. As it happened, I didn't restart the pro project until Julia was about 10, at which point I suddenly seemed to have a slew of reasons to finish it. One of those reasons, of course, was that there was another child in the family who would need to know at some point what had happened to her father, especially after John had a relapse when she was six and seven. 
and she watched him go from her beloved wacky daddy to a virtual stranger in the space of a few weeks. And then she watched this stranger fall deeper and deeper into depression's black hole, hole for months before he underwent electroconvulsive therapy and suddenly found himself vastly improved. There were other reasons with that propelled me to finish the book quickly and without all the earlier angst. The main, the main run, I think, was the passage of time, which gave me the necessary distance to write about all this without reliving it in the worst kind of way. I was shocked to find that the writing was amazingly easier 17 years after the shooting than it had been only seven years after. I attribute this not only to the distance that time had given me, but also to my discovery that I'd actually been writing, in, writing it in my head for all the years that the project had been lying untouched on my bookshelves. Another part of it was age. I was 38 when John was shot, and I'm perilously close to 60 today. At some level, I wanted to get things down on paper before time ran out. John, too, wanted to make sure the three children understood what all of us had gone through. Not just the physical wounds from the bullet that hit him, but also the psychological ones. Not simply what depression did to their father and to my mother, but to all of us. I wanted our children to have a basic road map through and out of depression, should this illness ever hit them, to help them navigate their own lives and those of their children. I did not want them to suffer the same conspiracy of silence and ignorance that I did as a child, and which continues to surround mental illness today. By the time I restarted this book, we were all on board to tell the story of how we got through a time of seemingly endless troubles. All of us, including my 91-year-old father, hoped that our experience might help other families going through similar trials. And with US troops in Afghanistan and Iraq, there's a lot of potential for similar trials. All that said, I never would have been able to write the story of our troubles had I not had a parallel book running inside my head, too. That was a very different book a basically positive story about food, a story running from my earliest memories of childhood to the time John and I moved back to Rome and he was at his sickest. That was the year I got an insider's look at Campo dei Fiori, the big outdoor fruit and vegetable market in Rome's historic city center. We lived a block away from the Campo for the entire year that John was at his worst. And it was the compo that kept me sane the entire time John wasn't. I had actually talked to a publisher in New York about writing a cookbook about the compo back in late 1995. But she counseled against it when I told her our story. Write a memoir, she said, not a cookbook. So I went back to Rome and made my first stab at it. It didn't take more than a few horrible sessions at my little Tandy to realize that I couldn't possibly write, and no one could possibly read, a simple litany of the perfect storm of disasters that hit us, one after another, starting in late 1989. My being beaten unconscious by riot police in Prague, John's shooting, and about five weeks later, his seven surgeries and hepatitis B, our tra transfer from a place we loved to a place we didn't. The loss of my job, subsequent money problems, the unexpected suicide of my mother, the diagnosis of cancer in my father, the return of my brother's childhood kidney disease, and then John's descent into a drug-resistant clinical depression that left him virtually speechless for months. I knew that unless I managed to write about the good things that always kept me going as a child and that were again keeping us going as battered adults, I would never be able to make our trouble, troubles look like anything more than a long, whining complaint. As it happened, about the only thing that went right during those endless years 
that everything went wrong was the support we got from family and friends and the food we ate together three times a day. So it's not surprising that keeping the feast wanders back and forth between old recollections and new, with food as the thread that connects them. I may write about the smell of asparagus, the color of polenta, or the taste of figs still warm from the sun, but all of it is a personal shorthand for weighing hunger and love, health and nourishment, secrets and revelations, illness and survival, comfort and celebration, and above all, the joy and gift of being alive. What do I mean when I talk about food? I don't mean fancy food, expensive restaurants, or complicated meals that take days of preparation. I don't mean food as a fad or food as competition. I'm not talking about TV shows where chefs duel at parallel stoves, taking pot shots at each other, and swaggering around studio kitchens. When I talk about food, I mean the simple magic of honest food, fresh, wholesome, nourishing, simply prepared, and eaten together two or three times a day, just like the meals that both John and I had grown up eating around our family tables. And so, within a few days of starting to write this book, I knew I had to come up with a way of writing about the unspeakable by way of the edible. I didn't have to stretch at all to make strong con connections between food and life. I was surrounded by unmissable food life connections, literally from the day I was born, a scrawny baby who came out looking just like a plucked chicken, my mother always said, and nothing like those plump, dimpled Gerber babies of my mother's dreams. Consider that my mother spent much of my childhood making sure I knew that refined white sugar was little better than poison, that sugar was only slightly less dangerous than sperm to an unmarried girl like me. <laughs> Imagine then my disbelief when a team of high-powered trauma doctors in Munich decided to treat the 15-inch open trench wound across John's back by bathing him twice a day in a giant warm bath of chamomile tea, and then by packing that ghastly wound with nothing other than refined white sugar. I want to talk a bit now about family secrets. It's a topic I suspect many of you know a lot about if you grew up in the 40s and 50s even the 60s and 70s. Family secrets were, generally speaking, a very big part of family life. When I was little, the word cancer was never spoken aloud in our family, only referred to in shorthand, CA or the big C. When I was little, gay children tended to move three time zones away rather than tell their families or worse yet back then, have the neighbors find out they were gay. When I was little, my mother, who suffered four postpartum psychoses, one after each of her pregnancies, never told her children or most of her closest friends that she suffered from depression. And though people today talk far more openly about cancer and most other illnesses, Though many gay children today can come out to their families with at least a hope of understanding and acceptance, mental illness is still, by and large, barely spoken of in polite company. This silence continues despite the fact that some 33,000 people in the United States die by suicide every year. This silence continues despite the fact that every day about 90 Americans take their own life and 2,300 attempt to do so. The silence continues, though suicide is the second most common killer of college students in the U.S., the second most common killer of women aged 15 to 44, 
and the fourth most common killer of men in the same age group across the world. These deaths are a major public health problem, but we're still not talking about them. Instead, we whisper if we say anything at all and hang back from helping afflicted friends and family members because we're not supposed to know that so-and-so is depressed. Why that is has a lot to do in the end with the fact that mental illness still carries with it an abiding sense of shame and culp culpability, even though the experts know that much of the illness is in fact physical due to chemical balance imbalances in the brain. Nobody today is ashamed to tell their friends they had the mumps or a heart attack, but there are very few people who speak matter-of-factly when their family is hit by clinical depression, schizophrenia, or manic depression. Keeping family secrets paradoxically tends to keep those very secrets throbbing and active and perking along. I lost my mother to, to depression when she was 73, 30 years after her last bout of postpartum psychosis. Her suicide helped kickstart John's depression two years after his shooting. Had we kept silent about his illness and her death, we're both convinced that our own children, and now a grandson too, would have been at far more risk of falling into the same sort of downward spiral at some point in their lives. That we chose to talk about John's depression with them has given them a far greater understanding of the situation and a ton of ammunition should they, they themselves ever face the same illness. They know that just because their father suffered depression, that it's not a given that they will too. They know enough to type symptoms of clinical depression into the search window of their computer to find the list of warning signs for depression. They know enough that if the symptoms last for more than two weeks, it's time to call in the doctors. They know it's not just the depressed family member who needs medical care, but the entire family too. Our children also know that the main thing to do if clinical depression strikes is to hang on and wait for it to pass, for it is usually a cyclical illness, not unlike a fever, and that it tends to run a natural course, coming and going, with or without treatment. The trick is to keep the sufferer from killing himself while the fever is raging. The children also know, much to their sorrow, that the fever of depression can last as long as 18 months. One last thing, the children and I all know that while many people are helped by antidepressant drugs, huge numbers of people are not. We know that people suffering from drug-resistant depression can often be helped and remarkably quickly by electroconvulsive therapy. Now, I loved Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest as much as anybody. I adored Jack Nicholson in the movie of the same name. But both gave old-fashioned shock treatments, portrayed as a means of punishment and a show of power, a really bad name. New methods of admi administering electroconvulsive therapy are only now slowly coming back into medical fashion. They can and do work miracles for many people who are not helped by antidepressants. I'd like to shift gears now and give you an idea why though the book talks at length about depression, it's not depressing, but instead about hope and grace. I'm just going to read a few passages um, from the more food-oriented parts of the book to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. The first is from the first chapter called Hungers. Some mornings beginning in March, I wake up hungering for green asparagus. It is a grown-up hunger, for I don't remember cr asparagus cravings before I was 12 or 13 when my father learned to braise them in butter under three or four leaves of dripping wet lettuce. The lettuce, lightly salted, would wilt. 
then give up a mild sweet juice in which the asparagus would steam. When they were done and my father lifted the lid, a cloud of vegetable essence would fill the entire kitchen. My mother would sigh in delight at the smell of it, and even my brother, five or six at the time and still finicky in his appetites, would devour them. On those days, our hunger for asparagus was boundless. These days, I find myself willing local asparagus into the market even before it's ready for harvest. By the time they actually arrive, I can almost taste them. But it's not just the taste I crave. I hunger as much, perhaps even more, for what their seasonal appearance signals, that the dark and cold and death of winter is about to yield to the sun and heat and promise of spring. I hunger then for their springy green color, for the sharp crack they make when I snap off the bottom of a muddy, fibrous, white-tipped stalk. I hunger, too, for the sight of them in an orderly buttered mound, lying on a thick white pottery platter and covered with freshly grated parmigiano reggiano cheese. I even hunger for the proof I have eaten them, for asparagus is the only vegetable I know that produces a veg vegetal acrid smell in pea. I hunger, too, for that cloud of asparagus lettuce perfume that used to fill our kitchen when I was 12 or 13, and the four of, them, and the four of us ate them happily. The next part I'm going to talk about is from a, ch a chapter called Birthday Cake. Uh, and this chapter starts off with um, an explanation of what um, my, our Sundays were like when I was a child and really until I was 18 and came up to Wellesley to go to school. I never, every single Sunday of our life, we all met at my maternal grandmother's house and all sorts of relatives came, sometimes even um, the father of the, my cousins here. Um, and the, the dinner was always the same. My grandmother would make some kind of pasta. That could change the type of pasta, but the sauce was always the same. Her Neapolitan rag, ragu, and there were meatballs and sausage and chicken and pork and bracciole, um, all of them cooking in her thick Neapolitan sauce. A mixed salad, good for the digestion, always followed the meat. The only variable dish was dessert usually one of Jenny's homemade American specialties, fresh blueberry, apple, cherry, or pumpkin pie, depending on the season, Boston cream or lemon meringue pies on occasion, or on birthdays, my favorite, auntie's chocolate cake, a moist, sour milk, two-layer concoction spread thickly with Jenny's soft white frosting and covered in grated coconut. As a child, I loved to watch the vinegar, Heinz's white, not my grandfather's red, start to sour the warm milk. If I stared long enough, I could see the milk begin to thicken and coagulate from the chemical reaction with the vinegar. When the cake was pulled from the oven, leaving moist, dark crumbs on a toothpick tester, I loved the sight of it sitting on a cake plate in the center of any of the tables from my childhood, whether it was my birthday or somebody else's. Jenny and Tony, Great Uncle Pete, Great Aunt Philly, Dee Dee, Auntie and Uncle, Cousin Joe, Cousin Al, my mother, all are gone today, along with all the other great aunts and great uncles and nearly all the second and third cousins who used to join us on special occasions. My grandparents' generation produced few children. My parents' generation, even fewer. Aside from me, the only ones left from that great crowd of family that used to celebrate Sundays and birthdays together are my father and brother and auntie's son, my lone first cousin, Paul. I never lost the recipe for auntie's birthday cake no matter how many times I have moved. 
the recipe, stained with melted chocolate and vanilla, travels with me to each new country, each new kitchen. I make auntie's cake at least once a year. A single bite of that cake still conjures up the days when all the characters of my childhood used to sit around Jenny's kitchen table on Whitney Avenue in Bridgeport, celebrating the joy of birth. When I was little, when my parents were young, when my grandparents were still only in their 60s. It keeps those Sunday dinners alive in my memory, keeps alive my family dead. And then I'm going to read one um, that's um, just 10 years, a, a memory of, from 10 years ago. And it's about our um, youngest child, Julia. My favorite memory of Julia's babyhood is tied up with my father's 81st birthday, which we celebrated the July she was two on the terrace of the lake house at Trevignano Romano. Dear friends who once lived in Rome but who had moved back to Moscow were coming to spend the night with us on their way to their annual visit to Elba. I had planned a big fishy dinner, not the boiled lobster or the big scampi we might have eaten in Connecticut, but Mediterranean sea bream, baked whole with thinly sliced potatoes, very ripe cherry tomatoes, and handfuls of freshly chopped parsley, all dribbled with good fruity olive oil and seasoned with sea salt and freshly cracked black pepper. Our friends told me they would take care of the first course and they arrived in a rush of hugs and kisses with a large bottle of vodka and a plastic tub full of the best black caviar, the kind one could buy at the time only in Moscow and only with the right connections. While Julia played happily with their two girls, Celestine and I toasted slabs of rustic Italian bread, buttered it lightly, then slathered the toast with caviar. We piled those slices of toast on a huge hot platter and set it on a long wooden table that sat near the giant wisteria vines overlooking the lake. The adults drank icy vodka, the children drank chilled apple juice, and we all laughed and talked and toasted my father's health as the sun slowly started to sink behi behind the house. We drank more vodka and began nibbling the warm crunchy toast with caviar. I'd eaten caviar of that quality only once in my life, more than a decade earlier, while visiting Moscow at New Year's. For my father, it was a first, and none of us, children included, seemed to be able to get enough of it. I quickly made more toast and refilled the platter. Julia, sitting in her jump seat and facing her grandfather at the far end of the table, watched our friend's girls, about five and eight, spread caviar on their last bit of toast. She had already eaten two enormous slabs, barely coming up for air. She looked up from her empty plate and asked during a momentary lull in the conversation, Mama, more bread and black jam? <laughs> All of us burst into laughter. I was thrilled to see that at the age of two, she had already learned how to celebrate the life we are given around a table with good food, close friends, and family. John went back to um, Timisoara, Romania in 1997, a few, uh, three months before our daughter was born. And he went because his shrink basically thought it would help him to go back, look look the place over and try and sort of get get it out of his system. It was He thought it would be a good way to maybe move forward. And he was very nervous about doing this, but he decided he would. And the New York Times decided they would run a magazine story, if he could do it, he would write a magazine story about Romania. And his plan was to go there and go to Timisoara and interview the doctors and nurses who had saved their li his life 
and who basically he wanted to go back and thank the doctors and nurses, see what Timisoara looked like now, or s at that time, 1997. And then he, d he went and interviewed the, the president of the country as well. He was a new president. While he was in Timisoara, uh, they, he was told who had shot him. They knew who had shot him. He had the name. And um, he, he could have, and he thought about it briefly. And he just said to himself, this would accomplish absolutely nothing. Um, it was a war. It was wartime. It was a war zone. This was a sniper. He just decided it would accomplish nothing. Um, I thoroughly agreed with him. And uh, it had nothing to do with the person who fired the bullet somehow for us. Um, John was only a target because he was in a foreign car with these other journalists. They knew they were foreigners and because no one in Romania had a Western car. So it was, it was sort of impersonal, if you will, it, the shooting. It wasn't like someone actually said, there's John Tagliabue and I'm going to take this gun and try and kill him. It was a soldier uh, shooting a bullet at a, many bullets at a car and one bu bullet finding John. So in the end, um, no, he, n he never did. And neither of us have ever been interested. Because it, ch it wouldn't change anything that had happened, happened to us. It was the fact of the bullet, not who pulled the trigger. It didn't really matter. He was, however, I have to say, this, this was a curious part. When he went back, he really was still quite jumpy. And he could. He would go around and do all his interviews all day long, but the minute it began getting dusk, because he was shot at night, and the minute it began getting dusk, he would go back to his hotel, and he said he ate breakfast and lunch out, but he never had a meal. He wouldn't leave, the, wouldn't leave his uh, hotel at night. It was too frightening. And, um, but it did help. It did help him, and uh, he did write this story, and... Uh, but it just didn't seem to make any difference to us. And I think in the end it's, it, that's helpful because um, you could get fixated on the person who did it and it's, it's not the person so much, it's the fact of, <laughs> it's more the fact of the bullet and where the bullet ended up as opposed to who pulled it. Um, and perhaps that would be different again if it were someone who was who was really gunning for you, but they weren't gunning for John, they were just gunning for anybody who was out there. When um, we were transferred to Berlin after uh, John was better, um, when he could start to go back to work, and a short time after we got there, we moved back there in uh, September of 1990. And, um, in and John's brother, um, it was Paul Tagle is to Paul Taglebu, the former NFL commissioner. And in that position, he was always getting to meet famous people. And somehow he, was in co uh, he met Ronald Reagan. And in passing said, oh, because R Reagan was shot, he said to him, oh, my brother was shot. And the two of them started talking. And Reagan immediately said to Paul, I want to meet your, your brother, Where, you know, and, and Paul said, well, they're in Berlin. Or do you ever go to Berlin? <laughs> and he said, well, as a matter of fact, I have to go in October because they're giving me the key to the, key to the city. So we um, got word from Reagan's people that we were to show up at the, 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 this hotel, uh, and we would meet Reagan, and then we would um, sit and chat with him privately for a bit, and uh, then that would be it. And so we dutifully get dressed up and knock on the door, and door opens, and there he is. And um, he um, had us come in and sit down. And uh, all he wanted to do, and I'm, I'm really serious, all he wanted to do was ask John if he knew, if he felt the bullet go through him. And John 
found this a little puzzling at first, and he said, well, yeah, I mean, it came in, I felt it, and then I felt it, like, and he actually said, scurrying like a mouse. It felt like something scurrying like a mouse through me. And um, Reagan said to him, you know, I didn't feel it when I got shot. And, and when they threw me into the car, and I came, d I came down hard on them, I guess there was an, um, an armrest in the middle of the back seat, and he thought he'd broken a rib when they threw him down on the, and he, he, he didn't know he was shot until he was in the hospital. And, um, and then he said, I ask everybody I meet who's been shot whether they've, <laughs> they've felt it. And most of them, just about everybody does. <laughs> and it was so, but it was very charming. And he was, I have to say, I mean, he was per perhaps not my um, idea of, of, um, of um, well, he was a good, he did what he could uh, for, for anti-communism, but he wasn't exactly my favorite president in the world. But still, he was totally charming and absolutely in disingenuous and, and said, and then he began talking a lot about how his w wife was working with, you know, he, he rode he, um, horses, and after the shooting, he said the one thing that got his, got his health back was riding horses, and how then afterwards they, there was this program where children who were autis autistic, they were put the kids on horses because this seemed to I help them. And then he served us coffee and chocolate cake and sent us on our way. It was a very, it was just a very odd but lovely <laughs> day <laughs> in Berlin. <laughs> and then the next day he went and got his key to the city. No. Um, the support of the New York Times was really helpful. Um, we were privileged in that sense. Um, if, you're, if you have to have depression, it's so wonderful to know that you're not going to be fired. And that they, they really, they basically said to him, his editor, um, who was totally understanding, said to him basically, John, you have a new job with the Times from today onward. That job is to not write stories and not be a reporter. Your job is to go get treated by an excellent doctor and do everything the doctor says and really work at getting better. And we don't want to see your byline until you're better. And we don't care how long it takes. Now, that didn't happen on day one. We didn't know that at the beginning, and we were nervous for months before this was actually said, um, like while he was in the hospital. I mean, we knew when he was dying in the hospital, they weren't, certainly weren't going to fire him. But afterwards, when he got the hepatitis B, and it was like months, it was months and months before he could go back to work. Um, he got shot in late December. He didn't get out of the hospital for a couple of months, and then, then there was rehab, and then only after the rehab did the hepatitis start, and then he got sick again for months, two, three months, and then it took another three months before it started to come back to normal. And once it came back to normal, it was very slow. So in that sense, we were extraordinarily lucky. If we hadn't had Rome, um, I think we could have, he could have gotten better in, in, other, in another place. It didn't have to be Rome. But it was easier to be if you were in a place that you liked and you, were, you had once been happy in. Um, it would have been very hard to be in a place we hated. Or it would have been very hard to be in a place where it rained 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That would have been hard just in general. So the sun and light and heat helped. Um, and the food worked for our family. But it worked for our family not because there's something magic about sitting around a table, I mean, obviously. But what it was was that that's what made our family feel good because we had done that sort of thing as children. You know, other families maybe would, um, maybe if they were, if their family fun was going on hikes, you know, maybe a hike every day or a walk or a walk, I don't know. Every family, I think, has to find something that 
brings back a little of the joy of life because really what depression is, aside from the chemicals going awry, is the loss of joy. There is no pleasure. One loses all hope and pleasure and joy. One only sees black. And, and so, um, you know, to this day, there's nothing he likes to do more with our youngest than like watch wacky movies that make him laugh. You know, Monty Python is big in our house. And any, any movie that's really funny and old, but old fashioned funny, we can't do, even today, we can't do stress movies, thrillers, guns, can't do them. And we went to a movie a few years ago in Paris. It was a German movie that came out just a few years ago called um, Goodbye Lenin. I don't know if it came here. East, yeah, and it was an absolutely marvelous movie, very light, sort of a light movie. I mean, serious, but light at the same time. It wasn't sort of, you know, heavy. And, and the movie started with um, just as East Germany was about to fall, the old East German govern, gov government was about to fall, and there was a shot of riot police everywhere, white you know, the helmets and the batons and the shields. And I, had, I, ha I thought I was over my beating, but the minute I saw this thing come on the, f on the film, I just got hysterical, quietly hysterical in my seat. And it took me 10 minutes to like pull it together. To s and the movie was, aside from that, which was what didn't even show that much real violence, um, you know, it does, it does stay with you for a long time. But, um, but I think, to go back to your original question, you just have to find something that gives you pleasure and, and, and try and make yourself and the person who's suffering um, find, you know, latch onto this um, for um, at least, you know, two minutes a day or three minutes, anything. You just need to do something that gets you through the day until you can go back to sleep because a lot of it is just this passage of time where they're, where they're in this terrible predicament um, uh, to just get through it because it will go away. And that's the thing. My father used to call me every Sunday. This is back in the old days when um, uh, phone, phone calls from America to Europe were, you know, dollars per minute. And he would call once a week. And if I got... And often that was my only time to sort of vent or, you know, s complain because I was afraid to complain to him. He was already so sick. I was always afraid that if I did, if I said anything, that would be the thing that would, you know, send him off out the window or into the water or, you know. So, you know, you'd keep really quiet, but there'd be moments when you'd just want to kill him and then you want to, <laughs> or you need to talk to somebody. And so my father would call every Sunday afternoon, right after lunch, and we would, he would, he'd listen to me, and he's, he's very upbeat himself, and he had dealt with m my mother's illness very well uh, for, for all those years, and then when it came back, and he just kept saying to me, just remember, Paula, just remember, it's not John, it's the illness, and that was the, b that's what helped me the most, that one line, I just used to keep saying it, it's not John, <laughs> it's the illness. But it did help. Um, and so you have to just find whatever works for the particular family. Because um, I think every family is totally different, especially, I mean, if you come from a family where, you know, mealtime was very unpleasant and, you know, there was somebody, it was awful, this, this, this will not be of any use whatsoever. <laughs> but, you know, it, was, it worked for us. <laughs> for a very long time, he, and he, when he was sick, he really didn't make much improvement. He would even, even when he would go to the doctors, he couldn't really talk to the doctor. Often he'd just go in to the doctors and cry for an hour. And that was a very expensive cry. But anyway, he would, he, this went on and on and on. And I think because I had grown up with depression as a child in, with my mother, and I was a child because I was the firstborn. So she had these four um, bouts of postpartum psychosis um, from the time I was born until I was eight with, with periods of 
being okay after she would have electroshock treatment. And I think it's be it was because I was a child and I didn't think I could do anything and I probably couldn't have done anything as a child. So that when John got sick, my whole idea was, I just have to be patient, I have to be a good wife and be patient, you know, and this will pass. And in fact, there was a point where I was in with John's doctor and the doctor had a um, family therapist to help me get through it all. And um, they basically said, your patience is not helping John. Your patience is too long, too patient. This is not good. He needs, you need to make some demands of your own because otherwise, they were afraid I was just going to blow up and walk out the door at some point. And so there I, they, they tried to push me to respond in a different way. And it was at the same time that um, I used to go to the Campo dei Fiori every day and buy these fruits and vegetables. And I would buy them just enough for the day so that every morning I could go back. And when I would walk home um, after th this little visit to the Campo, I would pass a church, a little tiny church called Santa Brigida in the Piazza Farnese. And it was a convent of cloistered nuns, the Brigidines. And they, would, they, they were cloistered, so you couldn't see them very much. They'd be off in a, in a side chapel, but you could hear them singing. It was very beautiful, very small, quiet church. And I would go in there and just kind of plop my bags down. And for, for months, I would go in there and just sort of slump there, kneel down. I wasn't praying. I wasn't doing. I just, often just tears would come down. And um, at the time that they started talking about anger and, and letting out my real feelings, one day I noticed I walked in there and I put the bags down. And, and suddenly, I'm banging my fist on the pew in front of me. Just, and I'm, and then like, it was like an out of body experience. And I'm looking like, I don't usually do stuff like that. So, um, and I was really, sh um, it was sort of the first time that I, f I responded in a, in, a, in a real way and not trying to mask everything, not do everything for John. And basically, um, at the, but right about that same time, we were out walking and um, he got in front of me in the, um, uh, while we were on this walk and suddenly I'm looking at him. And when people are seriously depressed, very often, um, and they're on drugs as well, very often there's a, they get this funny walk and it's stiff knees and stiff legs and they kind of look like Frankenstein, you know, and they're walking like this. And it's, and he was walking like that and I, I looked at him from the back and I just went bananas. It, this all came out around the same time. And I just started screaming, saying, you know, if you don't stop walking like Frankenstein, I'm going to lose my mind, you know. And, and he doesn't remember this. He does not remember this incident. And for me, it was sort of the turning point when I realized he's got to get better. And, and that was when I started putting demands, like, I know you can't talk, but I demand that every day you send, say at least two sentences to me, and I want to hear them every morning or afternoon. I don't care what time, but I have to hear at least two sentences. And once it started, it seemed to get better. Now, had I done that at the very beginning when he was still going down, I don't think he probably could have responded. But at the, t at the time, it just worked. That so, um, but I think the, the key thing was that, that if there's somebody in depression in a family, the key thing, I don't understand how, because I know in the States now the doctors can't, don't want to talk to the family members because it, it gets involved in their um, pri privacy, confidentiality. confidentiality. I don't understand how they can possibly <laughs> hope to get better if everybody isn't on board getting help. And um, it was extremely useful as, a, as a, the mother to get a, a trained therapist's uh, um, prescription, sort of. What do I tell a six-year-old? What are the words I use? And when I got that, it was great for her, our daughter, but it was also great for me because sometimes this children's language 
it's so clear that even we can get it, you know? And because often we go on and on about how, you know, all these deep things, and basically all you have to know is he's really sick. It's not his fault. It's not your fault. He can get better, and he's doing everything he can to get better, but, but we don't. We just have to hold on. And the, and the main thing is you don't, like, tiptoe around him. You don't tiptoe around the sick person. You, the doctor kept telling the doctors kept telling us, you and Julia have to try and live the most normal life as, it, as if nothing ha was go going wrong. Try and keep having fun. Try and do things that are fun for you because that way he'll see that that's the way life was and will be. And if you all hide back, then it just, then that becomes, that becomes the dominant force in your, it's, it's just more complicated. And so I think for me, the, the most important thing would, was to have help. And each, and you needed special, like, so what do I tell the 25 year old, you know, and what do I tell the, tw that sort of thing. It was very useful because they really were at different levels and, and hearing all the different ones helped me because it was like three different ways to think about it. I think um, at some point during John's second depression after the shooting, I made my peace with the idea that this is an, an illness that can come back. Um, I have to be able to say, well, someday he might not make it. And I've, I've, I've made my peace with that. And meanwhile, we're just having a really good time. And he's not sick. And this, this, the treatment he got this last time with the electroshock completely, I mean, he was, he was so much better and so much more quickly better that it made it all possible. And the, the, you could think that maybe it won't come back again. Or if it does, maybe it'll be so old, then we won't even notice. You know? <laughs> oh. It was really uh, a huge help. Um, uh, at the beginning, it was, it, was not, it was very hard. But once I came back to it and started writing it, it was a huge help both for me and for the whole family because we all talked about it all the time. I talked to John about it. Whenever I'd, I'd, I'd write something, I'd write a few pages one day. That day, one night when he came home, I'd give it to him and he'd say, oh, I don't remember that. And I'd say, well, yeah, it's here and this thing. And then he'd pull out his journal. He'd say, oh, but I had this too. And so it was this, that was helpful. And it was really helpful for us to talk to the children and, and air all of these things and find out what they thought when he was a, uh, when John was shot, they were eight and fourteen, the big ones, and um, it was very useful because we thought one thing, they thought something else. It was very useful uh, for all of us to um, talk about it, and um, and uh, somehow somehow it just it settled everything, and I feel now like we can go forward. It doesn't mean I think it's all better, i you know. I, I, it could happen again, but we do feel like if it does, we're better ready to, to work on it. No, I, we really weren't because John's been abroad since 1965, and I've been abroad since 1982, and so home, home is really sort of midway between in the, over the Atlantic, but that's where we've been living for so long that we didn't see any, any, uh, we didn't see, it. no, we just never thought about. Sometimes when these things happen in families too, it's that being, being apart from the family is sometimes helpful, but still with, as time went on with the phone calls and all of that, that was wonderful. I think um, it wasn't just other re reporters, I mean, um, but just anybody that's gone through something horrible, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and survived. Yeah. You know, that's been good. Um, um, uh, uh, nope. There's n there's nobody particular that's come up and called. But we know a lot of crazy reporters. So, um, <laughs> but nothing. It was more. It's more anybody who's already gone through something really hard. I think 
I think if you've gone through something hard, you just empathize. You're so much better at empathizing because you've been there. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you.